And I'll pass it over to Anika to introduce the campaign and everything. So um, kia ora koutou katoa. Thank you so much, um, John, for that introduction. Um, it's such a privilege to be here to speak with you all. Um, we thought we'd first just start off with a bit of an outline about who we are, if you don't um, <coughs> already sort of aren't familiar with us beforehand. And then we're going to do a bit of an individual who we are and why we got involved. Um, so Make It 16 is this youth-led non-partisan campaign. So we are, there are a lot of young people involved in our campaign. There's very few people of um, old age. So that's really awesome aspect to our campaign. And we're aiming to uplift and strengthen youth voice by extending the voting age to 16. And we've now become a group that's nationwide. So we have a really um, large spread across the country, which we'll talk about later. Um, but we have people from all over the country, from Northland to Christchurch to Auckland to Wellington, who are super passionate about this idea of lowering the voting age to 16. Um, I'll let um, Caitlin Okay. Sweet. Um, so just introduce myself. Kia ora. My name is Caitlin. Um, and it pronouns are she, her, and I am 20. I joined the Make It 16 campaign when I was 17 going on 18. Um, and the key reason why or how I stumbled upon Make It 16 was I found out my birthday fell two days short of the election day in 2020. And we were talking about political issues in school. I was really excited. There were two big referendums and I was really excited to finally vote and have my say on on what type of government would be running running the country because to me that that's quite important. Um, and then I found out my birthday fell two days short of the election day and I was very upset about that and I talked to everyone about that and someone mentioned Make It 16. And ever since then, I have been part of the campaign. I help run the social media accounts mainly. I also do a whole bunch of other communications things like emails, um, writing copy, occasionally helping out with PRs, um, and a whole bunch of bits and bobs to do with like the marketing of the campaign, basically. Um, that's a bit about me. Um, I'll pass it over to Sanat to introduce himself. Uh, kia ora everyone, Ko Sanat Tukwingwa. It's really nice to be here to present to you all tonight. It's, it's quite a privilege, actually. Um, for me, I think the reason I joined Make 16, there are quite a few reasons, but I've, I've been a part of the youth space doing community work since 2019, so since I was 15 years old, and now I'm an 18-year-old first-year student at the University of Oregon. So uh, throughout that time, you know, we faced the pandemic, the climate crisis isn't worsening, the mental health systems that we have in place for young people aren't really working. Uh, more and more globally, we can see a huge backslide in democracy and, you know, just general trust and in institutions declining. So for me, it's very much Make It Succeed was a pathway to at least try to create a better future for the way democracies work um, here, in, uh, here in Aotearoa and then throughout the world. Um, and also a way to sort of materialize a lot of the solutions that I and the community groups I've worked with in the youth space have been trying to do for a very long time. So um, I'm very passionate about this, and I joined probably late last year during lockdown, um, and it's been a pretty wild ride since then. I'm, I'm a co-director, but I do bits and bobs here and there uh, throughout the campaign. Um, the thing I'm really interested in, or the thing that I've been working on the most, is sort of creating connections and networks across the country to run a really effective, organized campaign on the grassroots level in, in different regions. Um, and We've had quite a few things happen this year, um, so we haven't had a chance to fully mobilize that, but general elections coming up next year, there's a lot of other stuff coming up next year, so it's going to be a really exciting time for the campaign. Um, I'll pass off to Anika. Yeah, kia ora. Um, so, ko Anika tokuungwa. Um, my name is Anika Green, and I've lived in Te Whanganuia Tara all my life. Um, I've always been super passionate about democracy and politics, and always been um, a really strong social justice advocate, um, similar to Sanat, have kind of worked in different community spaces growing up. I grew up in a community that was all about sort of um, helping people on the street and sort of solving homelessness. Well, not solving homelessness, but just um, supporting our homeless population. And um, yeah, again, similarly to Sanat, I feel like there are all these really pressing issues that young people have agitated successive governments about and we haven't had that um, change that people have been driving for. And because I'm so um, passionate about 
fixing all of these issues that face us today. Um, I was really, really keen to join Make It 16 again as, a, as an avenue to make our participatory democracy truly participatory and to um, empower our youth who politicians often make a song and dance about about the about youth voice and how important it is and I feel as though this would um, you know make have the most direct influence on these decisions that are going to shape our country and our future um, so I'm part of the volunteer kind of outreach and support um, leadership but kind of help bits and you know bits places like Caitlin and Sonat, um with comms and things um, so yeah it's, I also joined on the exact same meeting as Sunat um, during lockdown sort of last year. Um, it's actually pretty crazy. I was just thinking about it the other day that me and Sunat actually joined on the same um, outreach call. Um, yeah, that's fine. We'll move on to the next slide. Sweet. Um, so um, we believe um, in terms of why the voting age should be lowered to 16, is that issues that are disproportionately affecting our rangatahi across Aotearoa need these young people at the decision-making table to have that most direct influence on these decisions that will fundamentally shape our future. And we believe now that more than ever, that rangatahi have proven themselves in so many different facets of our society to care enough about democracy and politics in order to show up in it. Um, We've seen recently with our youth parliament event that happens triannually, how many people with completely differing political views are really willing to engage with our political system and wanting, wanting to participate in it. Um, so much so that they signed up to um, be youth parliamentarians. Um, but also so many other examples like our youth councils across our country and all of our political spaces like School Strike the Climate. And we believe that young people are able to make decisions that affect the course of their lives, but are not given the agency to change their future in our current, um, in our current state and laws. Yep. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so in terms of our story, um, Make It 16 came to fruition as a group um, through the Youth Parliament event that I just mentioned in 2019 where people from all parties across the house agreed that the voting age should be extended to 16. And it was a huge um, topic also discussed in this year's Youth Parliament event. Um, so much so that we saw um, a lot of media attention, which was incredibly awesome. And during the Youth Parliament event, there was also an open letter um, uh, in which over 60 youth MPs signed. Um, calling on the government to lower the voting age um, for both local and general elections. And um, I think it really, it really demonstrated, um, you know, in of itself, the event demonstrates how politically engaged young people are, but it also, the event showed how many people, how many young people care about this issue of lowering the voting age. Yeah. Next slide. And then, the next part of our story is that we launched our first petition um, to lower the voting age in 2020. And um, earlier this year in September, we handed it in with um, about 7,500 signatures, which was so awesome. And um, we think that that completely demonstrated that the cause had thousands of backers. And for us as an organization, we had a lot of emphasis and focus placed on that petition in order to demonstrate that we had that backing and to put that direct pressure on elected representatives um, to lower the voting age. And that's been a really um, awesome opportunity for us as an organization to think more strategically and tactically about how we grassroots campaign because um, that time of our petition drive was really about thinking about what Sanat's talked about before about networking and how we get more rangatahi involved across the country and just public backing in general. And what the slide also mentions is about Kate Shepard's first petition for um, women's suffrage only had 9,000 signatures. So the fact that we were close to the effort was quite a big achievement for us um, as an organization. Yep. And then um, the next part of our story is that 
um, earlier this year in June, we handed in our first open letter um, with 72 signatures from um, different local body elected representatives from across the country. Um, and we went to Parliament and um, handed it in to Ginny Anderson, um, who's MP for Hutt South and chairperson of the Justice Select Committee, which is really awesome. And we had a super productive conversation with her. And um, we had pictured in that photo Josh um, Trillin, who is a Porirua city councillor who came out all the way to um, support us as well. So that was really significant for us. And we'll be discussing that further as that open letter was specifically about um, lowering, the uh, lowering the voting edge for local body elections. Um, and that's of particular focus to us at the moment, um, trying to catch the momentum about that. Um, sorry, a bit of a mouthful, but we get in there. Um, so next up with our story, um, what we've really tried to do this year is to try and, like Sanat said, expand our network and try and reach out to those people who are super passionate about this, but just um, trying to make it that just easier step to be able to get involved. Um, so we've really grown our volunteer base very significantly. We've jumped from, um, so we have a we have a leadership group of about 12 people, but our um, platform that we use to communicate on, we have, I think almost, I'm not sure, maybe 90 or 100. Um, I'd say it's easy 100, yeah. And then we've also got a Facebook sort of volunteer chat that or volunteer group that was the original group and that had probably another extra 100 on there but since the campaign is three years old I think a lot of people have sort of aged up and, and felt like they need to pass it on to the younger people um, but yeah we've definitely got almost 100 on our, on our Slack channels now which is epic <laughs> I'll can let you continue Anika. Oh, thanks um, so yeah we've got a huge active volunteer base who's super dedicated and um, really passionate about helping out in any way they can and as we've Affa mentioned about um, our kind of regional hubs. So we have a regional hub in Tamaki Makoto, Auckland. And then we also have one here in Te Whanganui Atara, where I am um, in Wellington. And we're also supporting people in lots of other parts of the countries too, uh, the country too, who are trying to establish their own um, regional hub with the hope of trying to um, get more of their community on board with the idea of lowering the voting edge. And um, like, again, we were saying earlier about petition, um, we had our birthday month in, in September for three years, I believe, Caitlin? Isn't yeah, it? yeah, we had uh, our third birthday in September, yeah. Um, and that was really an opportunity for the established regional hubs, Tamaki Makoto and, and Te Whanganui Atara, to really try and um, push their grassroots um, campaigning to get people more on board with our petition and with our campaign in general. And that was really awesome. Tamaki Makoto has um, achieved some really, really awesome stuff. Sanat's and Sanat and Kaden, our two co-directors, have really led some incredible work up in Tamaki, getting lots of um, really well-renowned kind of community leaders involved with supporting Make It 16 and just having lots of open hooies and really starting a dialogue about this and about different ways um, we can strategically campaign. Um, yep. Sweet. So I'm going to go over our court case. Um, I am no means a, the legal person. Um, our legal and policy lead has been very busy. It's also his birthday today. So we thought it was fair that he'd at least have, you know, the evening to himself. Um, but yeah, I've been working with him, with Thomas a fair amount. So I think I'm capable of explaining it. So just to go over the, the basics of our court case. So the Electoral Act and the Local Electoral Act say that everyone 18 years and older has the right to vote. Yet the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act says our right to be free from age discrimination commences from the age of 16. So there is a di direct clash between those two laws. Um, and we had in 2019, we had um, some incredible lawyers from DLA, Piper, um, approach us and said, hey, there's a potential court case here. Um, and so that's what we did. They said that we can make a case about how this is actually unjustified age discrimination. Um, and the the voting age 
has to be demonstrably justified. Um, and as we know, there are many more reasons to justify a voting age of 16 rather than one of 18. Um, those reasons we're happy to go over later on in question time. But yeah, essentially during the entire court case, we um, were seeking what is called a declaration of inconsistency. And this is basically an announcement from the courts telling Parliament that this is a serious breach of human rights and that they need to fix this and sort it out. So our first um, case was in the High Court back in 2019, and then we got a dis decision from Justice Doge, I think it's how you say it, Doge, um, in late 2020. Um, and while they did find, while well, she did find that there was age discrimination, um, she believed that that discri discrimination was just justified. Um, and these are some photos back then when we went to the High Court. Um, some faces of the campaign have changed since then as um, Make it 16 is about so 16 and 17 year olds are two year age gap. It's since we've um three years old now, some people have aged up and, and passed the bed and on to younger people. Um, I'm probably going to be one of those people next year, seeing as I'm old, uh, 20 and kind of old for the <laughs> campaign. Um, but it's kind of cool looking back on on old photos and seeing how far we've come. There's also a documentary that followed our journey, taking this to the High Court. Um, unfortunately, we lost, so it is a bit of a depressing ending to the case. Uh, to the to the document documentary um but it's still really a, a interesting one to watch and I, i'm happy to share the link in the comments after this presentation um so since we lost in the high court we decided to take this to the court of appeal and appeal our case um and this one we almost won so there were three judges on this case and they did find that there was age discrimination and that the government could not justify it um so disagreeing disagreeing with the high court on the the second point but they agreed with our key arguments. Oh, sorry, basically they agreed with our key arguments, but they decided to um, use discretion and decline to issue a formal declaration of inconsistency. So in other words, while there was age discrimination, they decided they didn't have to formally say that. And the reason they gave that is because they believed it was a quintessentially political issue for the courts, um, which is quite frustrating since it was age discrimination. Um, but it was also encouraging because that did give us enough grounds to take this to the Supreme Court where um, issues and, and cases that are of public interest um, are normally d discussed and debated. And um, it, yeah, it basically gave us grounds to go to the Supreme Court, which was very exciting for us. And I'll pass this over to Sana, who's going to discuss the Supreme Court. Karen. Uh, Sorry, I'll just warn you in advance, there might be some noise around me. Um, there's an event currently going on in the community space that I'm sitting outside of, so apologies in advance, but I'd like to explain the Supreme Court case. So everything really changed for us uh, last week, Monday, when uh, the Declaration of Inconsistency came, and I'm going to be honest, I've, I've said this to a bunch of people, I haven't really processed it fully myself. Um, but we had our Supreme Court hearing in July of this year, um, and they very quickly came to us with a judgment. We were predicting that the judgment would come uh, in about January, but they came back to us last week. So, um, and they came back and said that, yes, there is age discrimination. Yes, it is unjustified. But the most important component of that entire thing was that they gave us that formal declaration of inconsistency to say that it is a breach of Bill of Rights. Fundamentally, it is unethical uh, to prevent 16, oh, well, no, it is unethical to continue to keep a voting age of 18. Um, sorry about that. So just in that, it's a very good event, I must say. Um, so just in that, we, sorry, I'm just going to wait for the noise to die down a little bit. Let's give me one second. Um, so just in that, uh, that was a monumental decision for us. It was a historical day for the, com uh, for the, for the campaign, but also for the country. Uh, because it was a landmark decision. But, you know, something that we hadn't seen coming for us was we thought that the government would follow its DOI process because they have a process to deal with declarations of inconsistencies. Uh, but rather very quickly, the situation developed into the Prime Minister announcing that a bill is going to be introduced to Parliament. Um, and we're, ex we're expecting that bill to be introduced before Christmas, actually. Um, so events have rapidly developed since last Monday, and we're very much gearing up for an intense probably six month period of campaigning. But this, course case, this court case is extremely monumental because now it does a couple of things for us. It really pushes the burden of proof on those 
people who are currently out there opposing us to really justify why 18 is still a valid age when there are demonstrable and legal and constitutional reasons as to why you know it really is um and that's incredibly advantageous for us and uh if we go to the next slide and it's also allowed us to really dominate some of the some of the media cycle uh, for the last week as well we've got an incredible amount of coverage in domestic media but we've also had some coverage from from international media as well so from the bbc from the guardian so very much sorry very much this has been a historical day for the country and a campaign but it's also a defining moment for us because we are now in some sense is a world leading campaign there are no grassroots movements in the world that are at this stage or have reached this level of um you know scale or relevance in political discussions across the world so we're very much carving the way for other grassroots grassroots movements in australia and the us and canada and the uk uh countries similar to ours to come out and start really fighting for this and that's a really exciting exciting piece for us as well if we go to the next slide sure can there you go cool so the bill is the most important thing for us now this is the mechanism that's obviously going to allow us to lower the voting age unfortunately very quickly the op opposing parties came out and said no we don't believe the voting age should be lowered and that's a little bit difficult for us because in order to lower the voting age for general elections we have to get over that entrenched provision um barrier that 75 percent super majority um it's kind of interesting because there's been quite a lot, quite a lot of conversation that we did not expect about that uh, entrenched provision in the in the media and just in general the public discourse as well. Uh, and so it's been brought into attention that look this this entrenched provision around voting age, where you can take away someone's right to vote for 51 percent with 50, 51 percent of parliament, but can only empower someone to vote with 75 percent of parliament is a little bit inconsistent. It's, it's a little bit funny. So that's an interesting something that's happening for us right now but since that 75 percent super majority exists we're currently in a very intense lobbying stage to make sure that there is a separate vote on local elections and general elections that separation in a single piece of legislation can happen um, or it can happen in two pieces of legislation but either way it'd be a little bit admiss for the government to not follow its own advice that it got from the future of local government review um, and not to you know make sure that its laws are consistent with the rights it guarantees to its citizens um, and make sure that the voting age is lowered for at least local elections. And we know that the votes currently, or we hope that the votes currently exist in parliament for that. So that's currently what we're lobbying for. So the legislation that's going to be introduced should have that separate vote. And we can expect then by next year uh, to have a lower voting age for local elections for the 2025 one. Um, if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, so yeah currently calling on cabinet ministers, we're really canvassing public support as much as we can. Um, Portugal Council came out with that motion. Sorry about that. It's an, came out with that motion for a 9-2 vote, saying that they backed us, um, and we're trying to replicate that across the country with councils and community boards as well. Um, and this is a really important thing for us because I think it's going to solidify the case that look, once you lower the voting age for any sort of election, the world doesn't stop turning. Once you bring 16, 17 year olds to the decision making table, uh, democracy is enhanced, people are empowered, uh, but more importantly, the bad things that people are talking about don't really materialize. And globally, when the voting age has been lowered, it's usually been in a local context first, uh, Malta being the most relevant example here where they lowered it for the municipal elections across the board first, and then their general elections more universally. So that's, that's really what we're trying to do here is develop a case to say, look, it works so well for local elections, now you can do it for, uh, for general elections as well. But that's gonna take a little bit longer. If we can go to the next slide. Cool. So okay. did we want to go into our next steps or do we want to pause here and... I think we're going to pause here. Here we go. We're ready. Next steps. Cool. Sanat. Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned before, the bill was introduced, or the Prime Minister said that they're going to introduce a bill uh, and we predict that bill is going to be coming out before Christmas, but there's some critical things that we want in that bill, but there are also some critical things we want to be doing as a campaign over the next two weeks before that bill is introduced, then over the next six months. Um, over the lifetime of that bill, so from first reading to, 
third reading, um, and then for the 2023 general election and beyond. Um, but as I mentioned before, the first thing that we're critically looking for in the next two weeks is that separation of local versus general. We really need to get over that um, supermajority barrier and at least get the voting age lowered for local elections. And so we've been urging cabinet ministers to either introduce those two separate bills or to have the separate um, to have the separation within a single piece of legislation. Um, then there's the 2023 general election, and I think this really serves as a battleground for us to do a lot of different campaigning that we haven't attempted before, especially across the regions where we've developed the networks and uh, communities that we need in order to get that over. So as I, as I think I was talking to Andrew about this a little bit before, but Make It Succeed is uniquely placed to really carve out a path or a distinct position for young people in democracy to participate in very different ways uh, than older people currently participate, right? Um, that overemphasis on voting and that three-year election cycle is not conducive to a healthy democracy. What is instead conducive to a healthy democracy is a culture of participating in civic discussions, uh, regardless of whether or not it's election year or not. Um, and so that 2023 general election time spend really gives us an opportunity to try out some really cool ideas with the communities across the country uh, to bring young people to the decision-making table and showcase and really, really showcase the entire country how capable they really are. Um, and then beyond that, that leads into what we have to do in the lead up to the 2025 local elections, uh, specifically around civics and ensuring that we create the best case possible where there is a higher participation from 16 to 17 year olds than there are uh, for 18 year olds. Obviously not a low barrier to cross, but we're gonna try hard to get it up there anyway. Um, and then the way the primary mechanism we see that happening through is through our regional campaign hubs. They're going to be the entities that allow us to really get our foot in the door in spaces across the country and talk to people that are disengaged, disadvantaged, um, and work with them to really redefine how young people are going to be engaging in democracy for generations to come. Cool, so if you go to the next slide. Um, and one of the questions that was asked to us uh, in that little meeting we had with Simon and John before this, uh, before this presentation was how do young people experience our democracy? What is their sort of, what is the sort of way that they're going to participate if they're not going to be voting? What is the status quo right now? And I sort of wanted to outline that the guts of it are here. It's pretty bare bones because there aren't really significant or substantial avenues to participate unless you're already engaged, you're already privileged, you're already, you know, uh, you already have access and experience in these spaces, right? There are institutional pathways like uh, submitting petitions or participating in select committee. And as we can, as evidenced by the millions of dollars that are being poured poured into youth engagement, obviously those those institutional pathways are not conducive to positive youth engagement currently as they stand. Obviously there are protests and that's an indictment on abilities for successive governments to represent the needs of younger people. Um, clearly, even in that, we're falling short of the, short of the ticket to really represent their needs. Um, there's community organizing and, and that's what we're doing is make it 16. And obviously we're still, we're still not able to capture the widest net of young people in out are possible to make sure that all of their needs are being represented or all of their needs are going to be on the decision making table. And obviously their civics education, which as it currently stands, is pretty bare bones in, in New Zealand's education system. Currently it is being introduced in successive stages, um, but what we really need to be doing as a, as a movement and as a collective set of organizations that are invested in the health of our democracy is to design and create a civics culture for young people that is a lot different to what it currently looks like today. And the reason I say lower, lowering the voting age is going to enhance all of these, you know, sort of pathways for young people to experience democracy is because suddenly they have tangibility. Suddenly they have a reason to care. Um, suddenly it's not about tokenistic representation. It's about, look, I have a vote what am I actually going to do with it? And I think we tend to underestimate the abilities for even the average 16 year old who we think is unengaged to have some really insightful opinions about the sort of world that they want to live in. Um, so yeah, how do young people experience our democracy? Currently not well, but Make It 16 is really uniquely positioned over the next few years 
to re-enhance and redevelop that space with all the current work that's going around um, to make sure that we are producing some really good youth engagement. Well, we can go to the next slide. So how can you support us in the efforts that we have coming up over the next six months um, in the medium term and then in the long term as well? Uh, there's some very quick tangible things that you can do. You can join our mailing list and just be in touch with all of the stuff that's happening in the campaign as it develops. You can donate to the campaign. We rely on donations from everyday New Zealanders to be able to fund some of the work that we're doing across the country. Um, but some of the more critical things that you can be doing are helping us get into spaces we usually don't have access to. We really enjoy doing presentations like this. We really enjoy um, going into different spaces and presenting our arguments, but moreover developing relationships uh, with, with people across this country so that we can sort of get to that work of developing that youth engagement culture that we need. So if you guys have access to spaces or you want us to present to a classroom or to a group that you know, please email us and we're more than willing to step in and, and do that because we love having those conversations. Um, and then when given the opportunity, obviously, help us raise awareness and change minds. So in, if you are supportive of us, if you do really like what we're trying to say here, um, what we find is that usually when you sit down with people that oppose us, uh, they tend to change their minds after you go through the arguments and you go through the works a little bit. So um, when given the opportunity, please, please, please help us fight this cause because anyone and everyone talking about it means that we're getting closer and closer to a goal. Cool. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, happy to take any further questions as a group.